Uh, good afternoon. Right now, this uh, we're going to have this section will be on anti-democratic practices used by party insiders. Now, the insiders are people that sometimes they are the elected leaders, and sometimes they are just people that have influence without the part within the party that may just be members. But these are things they use, tactics they use to get their way. Now, I'm going to start off with a little bit about myself, a brief biography, and then we can proceed from there. Okay, my name is Tom Avelka. I'm a professional parliamentarian. I'm a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians, and I have a, they have a credential of me as a PRP, which is a professionally registered parliamentarian. I'm also a member of the American Institute of Parliamentarians, and I've been con credentialed by them as a certified parliamentarian. I am chair of the Platt County Nebraska Democrats. I'm also a member of the Nebraska Democratic Party State Central Committee. But the title of which I am most proud is I consider myself a provocateur, troublemaker, and a pain in the ass generally. And hopefully by the end of this afternoon, you people will be, can have these same qualifications yourself. And I uh, thank for them for the little musical video of being a pain because you're going to have to be a pain. Okay, some th these now are the tricks that the establishment uses to um, interfere with your rights or to gain power over you. And I'll give a brief overview, then I'll go through them one by one. The first one is rule creep or corrupt extrapolation. The second one is custom, or if you've always heard the term, we've always done it this way. The third word is called the bandwagon, or be a team player. Fourth one is don't let a crisis go to waste. And finally, sub rosa is not a flower. So let's start off with that first one known as rule creep or corrupt extrapolation. That is, they take a rule that contains a limited authority to do something. And then this, they extrapolate from that a larger authority. In other words, the rule gives them an inch, but they'll take a mile. And here would be an example. Uh, the resolutions committee must report all resolutions. That's a pretty innocuous rule, and it's a good one to have. But they extrapolate that to mean that the rules committee has carte blanche to modify or reject resolutions. All right, so that's what they call a corrupt extrapolation. And the actual rule is never seen on a limitation, but as a gateway to a larger corruption. Okay, here's what Robert says on, about bylaws. And it says, if the bylaws authorize certain things specifically, other things of the same class are thereby prohibited. So if it says you can hold your annual meeting in January and February means the other 10 months are off limits. If it says you can do X and Y, it means all the other letters of the alphabet are off limits. It also has another provision. It says a provision granting certain privileges carry with it a right to a part of the privileges, but prohibit a greater privilege, which means very simply, that if it says you can do X, you can do all the things necessary to achieve X, but you can't do X plus or you can't do X, Y. So those are the things. So the bylaws should be viewed as limitations on what they can do, but they will extrapolate that to a larger report. Here is an example of how that might look, a conversation that's pretty similar to one I had not too long ago when we concerned different rules. And it's you, Madam Chairman, Parliamentary Inquiry. I believe that Bylaw 7.1 states that the Resolutions Committee must vote all resolution. That would exclude the committee from amending the resolution. Additionally, Roberts Rules section, section 5668 states, if the bylaws authorize certain things specifically, other things of the same class are thereby prohibited. Do you have any published rules to, contract, to contradict these rules? And the chair said, well, generally, I believe the rules say we can. All right. And here's the thing. The rules say we can't. Can you cite your rule? And you get kind of a deer in the headlights response to that. And that usually means that there's no such rule. So here's my thinking. And when you're old enough to draw Social Security, 
then you get to impart words of wisdom on the group. And here's my thinking on rule cooey. If it ain't in writing, it ain't there. It's that simple. Or the rule talks and opinions law. If you have a published rule and all they have is air, then the rule talks and opinions walk. The next item that is commonly used to against you or to suppress your rights is custom and history. Okay, when confronted about wrongdoing, history is cited. Usually intent is stated or custom is cited. We meant to do this or we've always done it this way and then they extrapolate there to assume that we always have to do it this way. Okay, now here would be an example. And I can tell you, I paid the traffic tickets. No, this doesn't work. But this, this is an example of a misuse of uh, custom. Officer, the sign is wrong. I always drive 70 on this road. I've been doing so for years. Trust me, the judge will throw that out. And here's kind of a general principle. You do not suspend or amend a written rule by the continued violation of that rule. Okay, now here is what Roberts says about custom. And there is a legitimate purpose for using custom in organizations, but, then, but it can be misused. So I'm gonna read from the good books of Robert, section two, verse 25. In some organizations, a particular practice may sometimes come to be followed as a matter of established custom so that it's treated practically if it was prescribed by rule. Now here's the kicker that everybody seems to forget when they want to abuse this. If there is no contrary provision in the parliamentary authority or written rules of an organization, such an established custom is adhered to unless the assembly by majority vote agrees in a particular instance to do otherwise. But that section in yellow is the one that they forget because when they're claiming a custom, then it has to be it, it has to be consistent with the rules. And Roberts goes on a little farther to state that if a customary practice is or becomes in conflict with the parliamentary authority or any written rule, and a point of order citing the conflict is raised at any time, the custom falls to the ground. So if they're doing something and it conflicts with the rules and you bring it up, then that custom is out the door. So be careful for the misuse of custom. Here's my view that I've gleaned on customs. If only one person knows about this, it ain't a custom. And a lot of times custom you'll see, and you find out that that only one person is to, remembers that custom. Well, chances are it's not really a custom, all right? The next one is the bandwagon technique. And this is that everybody does it. Okay. An organization will engage in a suspect act doing something. When you notice this and you bring it to their attention, you're told, Hey, don't worry about this. Everybody goes along. You're the only one. So get on the bandwagon and do this. The member is encouraged to be a team player. You'll something. be part of the team or, and what I don't like about this is that it ex exploits a member's desire to work together. You know, most of us want to cooperate and to achieve a common goal and work with an organization. And this is where they take advantage of it to do something that's wrong. Just go along to get along. And here's my view of teams. If the only time you're on the team is when they are running sleaze or want money, you're not on the team. And so that, that's so many times you hear about that. Come on, be a team. We're all working as a team. And it's usually when they want to accomplish. Then they forget when you want to accomplish your goals, you're not a team anymore. So beware of this bandwagon on the team. And that's used all too commonly. And then here's another one. It's called don't waste a crisis. And then an emergency is cited. This threat is then exploited to taking emergency actions. Well, because it's... The, the problem, we have to take emergency actions. And then those actions are used to basically limit or suspend the rights. You know, it's going to rain this weekend, so we have to do this. And finally, the actions go way beyond what the emergency would cause. And I'll kind of give you an example of this. Sharknadoes are forecast for the summer. So we all know that the Sharknadoes are going to be here this summer. Danger, danger, danger. Sharknado is coming. To cope with this emergency situation, we must take immediate actions. 
anytime you see that, be aware, okay? Because they're not working out for your interest. Then, therefore, we must suspend the election of officers for five years. But that's a bit of an exaggeration, but they use that emergency. And then when the emergency is over and the Sharknado has passed, they continue with the rules that are still in process. So that's something else to be careful. And we saw a lot of that last year with COVID restrictions. In fact, it, it's earned a nickname. It got so bad, not just in the Democratic National, but all over, that it was a term called COVID corruption, where they were taking advantage of the COVID situation to do some stuff they shouldn't do. Sabrosa is not a flower. That means when your organization is doing too many th things uh, under the table or in secret, you're creating problems. If you see a lot of meetings that are being held that should be open, and the rules of the DNC pretty much frown on closed meetings. All right. Executive committees are used to avoid scrutiny. Now, I don't know how it is in most Democratic parties, but in the Nebraska Democratic Party, the, the executive committee is supposed to be there to follow instructions, to carry out the policies that the state central committee uh, formulates. But if you see this committee abusing its privileges or the chair of the party is taking things to the executive committee that should be matters for the state central committee, then it's something to be suspect of. Now, I think from what I've heard, Nebraska is not the only party that's doing this. Okay. Members are not given to access to documents ahead of time. All of us, you come to a meeting and something that should have been, you should have been given a copy of two weeks is handed to you at the last minute and you're told you have to pass it, even though those rules wouldn't go into effect for another three, four months. You have to pass this right now. And finally, that members are generally excluded from the process. And like the lady from Rhode Island was talking about the general membership as excluded and things happen in secret and you're, you're so those are just forms of anti-democratic behavior that are done and on with all of these things there is sometimes some of these things have to be done in a in a very limited way but it should be for a limited purpose and if it only because it can't be solved that way so here's my view on secrecy and my view is secrecy is the birthplace of a corruption. It's only a matter of time. They're not meeting in secret to plan your surprise birthday party. So that's my view on secrecy. And now, is there any questions on this first part that I've went over? Uh-oh, looks like I must be pretty good at explaining things or nobody's paying attention, so. Um, All right. So we'll go to the next part now. Actually, Tom. Yes, go ahead. There, there is a question here in the chat. Um, oh, yes. About uh, standing rules. Um, let's see. No, I'm sorry. Let me go up and find it. <laughs> okay, I'm having a hard time using chat and PowerPoint. Sure, no problem. Tom, I have a rule. Custom and history is the same as standing rules question. No, standing rules are rules that are passed by an organization and they're supposed to be for administrative purposes. And the standing rule, it requires a majority to pass. And those are written rules that are in, actually in the rules. Now, when they say custom and especially the abuse of custom, it's something that you've been doing and you've been doing wrong. It either violates your parliamentary authority or your bylaws of your organization and they say well we've always been doing it this way even though it's improper for them to do it and so if that custom conflicts with any of your rules including standing rules then it it must fall to the ground you can't do it and it's like the lady that said i always drive 70 well that didn't change the speed limit on the road so likewise the fact that they have always been violating this rule published rule doesn't mean that it's right to do it. Now, if it's a published bylaw, you could maybe amend the bylaws to allow it. Or if it violates a standing rule, you could, uh, by a majority vote, rescind or amend that standing rule. So there is a, a standing rules or rules that an organization passes 
to dictate mainly administrative matters, not necessarily structural or parliamentary matters. But custom is something that is done, but it is not in a published rule. And there is a legitimate reason to do this. There is a legitimate purpose for the use of customs where you do something and you don't want, it's not in a rule. But that custom must comply with your existing rules, including the parliamentary authority in order to, and if it doesn't, then you have to abandon the custom. Okay, are there any more uh, questions here before we move on to the next part? Okay, the next part is fighting corruption, or as I say, enjoying life on the en enemies list, because believe me, as a, I think they have my name chiseled in there, because you will find yourself often on the enemies list or the new social registry, and don't be worried about that. But you have been the reason you're going to may find yourself on the enemies list is because a hit dog barks. So when you start calling it out, there's going to be some people that you're going to not going to like what you're doing. And that's just part of it. Okay, so let's take a look at the general origins of corruption. Corruption, I don't mean people are absconding with the funds. What I mean is that there people are moving to interrupt and interfere with your rights of membership and exclude you from the process, as the lady from Rhode Island talked about. And I want to kind of look at the backgrounds of what causes this stuff. And one is it's a failure to recognize that everybody is an equal member of an organization. And that happens, you get some people in here that just, they fail you. And I said, this is an animal form. Uh, some animals are not more equal than others. Everybody is equal. And a lot of times it's hard to, for, to realize that new person who is day one in your organization has the same rights as somebody who's been in there 30 or 40 years. So that's, that's just one of the origins where it's failure to recognize member equality. The next two go pretty much hand in glove. It's a failure to respect the rights of the members. And it's a failure to respect the rules. Because if you don't have one, you'll pretty soon you will not have another. If the people kind of ignore the rules and consider them just guidelines and kind of pick and choose when they want to comply with them, that's also pretty starting to disrespect the rights of the members because the members made those rules. And likewise, the people that don't really respect the rights of the members, pretty soon they don't particularly care about following the rules. So those are the two things you need to watch for in any organization, because if they exist, pretty soon you're gonna see power corruption. Another reason is the failure to hold leaders accountable, to be the pain, as a, that song would say. And uh, this can be, so although a fish may rot from the head, it gets plenty of help by the other people that let that fish sit out there and rot. And, it's, and when you see corrupt practices over a period of time, then you are supposed to hold the leaders accountable. It's your responsibility as a member to be to accountable. And I always said we everybody should kind of be your own parliamentarian and be familiar with the rules to make sure your own uh, organization functions as the rules. And finally, it's a tolerance of minor corruption. And I've always viewed that being a little bit corrupt is being like being a little bit pregnant because it's going to change over time and it's not going to get better. So that's why you have to minor corruption or you see little things. You know, sometimes you don't have to wage a war of it, but maybe just bring it to somebody's attention that this might be in violation of the bylaws. And a lot of people may not realize that they're violating the rules, especially Robert's rules. And if there's one thing that's read even less than Robert's rules by organizations, it's their own bylaws. And finally, the worst one or one of the, those is longevity. When you get your hang around Hannah or hang around Harry, who's been leading the same committee, who's been the chair of the organizations for 10 years, and they've been leading the same committee, especially the rules committees, organizations, they tend to have the old timers on them. I shouldn't say old timers, people that have been along for a long time. And they get pretty jaded in those offices. And one of the things that I would probably recommend, and it's going to be hard to pass, because sometimes you can't find people to take these jobs, is to about every four years or so, get yourself some new leadership in these organizations. Uh, because 
if you just get stagnant leadership, it starts to get uh, bad after a while. Okay, the next thing is that I want to talk about is kind of the warning signs that you may see in your organization, and you may see these earlier than expected. And this is a chance that you're to head off this corruption before it gets started. And I had a neighbor here who had a wonderful term that I've, and he had kind of a Eastern European accent that he used this, and it's probably the most, one of the terms you should use, to, it's one of the best cliches I've heard it said, where there's stink, there's skunks. And that's what he meant. He said, well, you're, there's something you see, there's somebody there creating that problem. So if you see something that's not right, there's probably somebody behind it. So we'll take a look at kind of the warning signs of corruptions that you'll, you may see. Uh, development of a caste system. All right. Unnecessary bylaw changes. Fixing things that aren't broke. If somebody said, we've got to do something here. And finally, actions to avoid scrutiny and suspicious activity that just doesn't fit in. And we'll go through these warning signs kind of one by one. Oh, and actions inconsistent with statements. That's another one I forgot about. And that's a polite way of saying they're lying. Okay, so let's go through the developing of a caste system. Are there insider, and these are questions that you need to ask yourself about your organization. Are there insider elites, people who hold themselves to be above the rest of the organization? Are members treated equally? Is everybody, you can see that. Are, mem are certain members given privileges that others aren't or is it given greater consideration? Okay, are members' rights being violated? Are you being, your, your rights of a member of that organization, are they being abused? Are you not getting to do what, what you do? For instance, you can speak and vote on resolutions. That doesn't mean that everything you propose is gonna be adopted, but your right is to propose these things and to debate these things. Okay, is the membership in the decision loop? So when there's or organization is undertaking things, big things, is the entire membership involved in the decision making or is it done by a select group? And I think the perfect example was that lady about Rhode Island, how they had their little committee and only certain people could be on the committee and it really wasn't open uh, to the whole group. That's usually a sign that your system is gonna become corrupt. Do the insiders hold themselves exempt from the rules? And this one is way too prevalent where they ignore the rules and they said, well, the chair doesn't have to do that. Or no, the committees, we really can do this. We're not really bound by that rule. And big one is if you say, well, Roberts doesn't really apply to us, you know? So those are the things you may see in the development of a caste system within your organization. Okay, unnecessary bylaw changes. Here is something, granted the rules should be changed, but all of a sudden you're seeing a change in a bylaw and for no particular reason. And that is the question you wanna ask yourself is why are these changes necessary? Why do we need to do these? And one term I've used, and I, because I heard it from somebody else and it sounded good, it said, what will be the adverse effect if this bylaw doesn't get passed, get amended? And the person kind of stood there and had no answer. And it, the bylaw change was defeated because when he said, um, and the reason that was, was he said, well, if there's going to be no adverse effect, if we don't change the bylaw, then only bad things can happen if we do. And yeah, if you think about it, if it can't benefit from it, then it can only cause harm, okay? Is the language vague? Is, does it give too much authority? Is it something that could be, or is it very precise, very precise language, or is it very, very vague and nebulous language? That's usually a, a symptom that even if they're not intending to cause problems, vague language can cause problems. So you have to look at that. Does the explanation wash? Is the reason they're giving really make sense at all? All right. Is the, for why they're doing it, does their explanation for it uh, make sense at all? And finally, have the key players been involved? And an example with that would be if you're going to change the bylaws to say talking about county conventions 
have have were the county chairs involved in this? Did they consult with the county chairs? Because if they haven't, then chances are they're they're doing something that's um, at least suspect at, at at best. So that would be uh, are the key players involved on this for these unnecessary bylaw changes. And finally, and here's a big thing to watch always in any organization: Does the change shift? power upward is it going from the people to the leadership to the committees things like this if there's an upward shift in power that's something you have to be cautious of because when that happens it's only a matter of time till it gets abused it may not be for two years it may not be for five but eventually that's one of those things that can cause abuse so you have to watch it now some of these conditions and let me go back on that some of these conditions will exist and have valid reason for, I mean, you know, there could be some, some, but if you see a consistent pattern of this, or if you see all of these things, you know, it's unnecessary, uh, vague language, then that's why you have to start looking and being suspicious of things. But yes, there are some times for when there could be a legitimate need to shift power upward for a temporary basis or something. So you have to kind of look at these things and say, if, if all of these things are there, you know, and the big thing is, does it, do they have a good explanation for these? Okay, now, fixing things that aren't broke. And a lot of those times, well, we're going to have to revise this. It isn't necessarily they change the bylaws. We're going to have to, to revise this. And this, you use almost the same thing. Is there any necessity to their change? Will there be an adverse effect if the change doesn't occur? Okay, does it make sense that they're doing this? If they're, you know, they can't seem, to, if they don't seem to have a good explanation for it, you have to wonder, does the change shift power upward? Is this new policy or procedure, is it empowering the chair more? Is it moving power away from the members towards the um, leadership? That's not automatically bad. Okay, but you have to ask yourself, if it's unnecessary, it's probably not a good thing either, and it will cause problems. And I'm almost beginning to think that the empowerment may be the corruption itself by just giving too much power, because it's eventually it's going to be abused. And finally, who is proposing the change? If it's a change in the county convention procedures, is it being proposed by the party leadership or is it by the county chairs? And who is proposing that change is something to be very careful of. Is it originating from the grassroots or is it from, originating for the leadership? And finally, is there a legitimate motive? Now, there's a lot of times that the leadership can cogitate in their own minds a good reason. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a legitimate motive to it. Is there, how is that change going to benefit the organization? Is there a legitimate purpose to, to doing this? And so before you do these things and you see this stuff, and this stuff is, you know, you have to ask yourself on that, if, is there a legitimate motive? And finally, again, we get into this avoiding scrutiny or this sub rosa. Do they use the executive committee a lot? Are there things that they're using the executive committee for that they should be using the whole committee for. And by the way, if there's an executive committee, that just differs from executive session. Executive session is a parliamentary term that means uh, you're meeting in secret. An executive committee doesn't necessarily mean you meet in secret. And uh, you should ask if, that you want to be on the list. Most of your executive committees now meet electronically and you should just say that you want to know when they're going to meet and you want to have the Zoom information for the electronic meeting in case you want to attend. And what they'll do is they'll, if they start giving you, well, we don't want, uh, we have, there's a lot of things going on. And then the question is this, unless you have something to hide, you know, what are you trying to hide and why are you trying to hide it? So one of the things you might want to, especially if your executive committee is doing a lot of things exceeding what they should be doing. So you, I would, that might be a thing to do 
is to ask just to be in attendance at the um, executive committee. This year, the um, American Institute of Parliamentarians, and I'm a member of that, all of their board meetings are open to all of the members. And you get the Zoom number, and when you sign in, you have to put a ZZ in front of your name so when they, it stays at the bottom of the list. You, you're not allowed to speak and debate or participate unless you get permission from them to do so. And it's, the idea came from uh, Al Gage, who is the uh, parliamentarian for the Republican National Committee. But it's a good idea uh, that they can do so. And they found that not only that, the meetings went better and smoother, and they were able to get some feedback from non-board members that helped them make a decision. So you're doing a favor to your organization by attending their executive committee meetings, all right? Are committee meetings of other committees open to the public? Uh, the Rules Committee, there's, there's no reason why that can't be open to the public. Platform committees, they can be open to the public. Just generally, you, uh, it's a good idea to have these meetings open to the public. Now, when they meet in person, there may be limitations. For instance, the room we met in couldn't hold but more than about 20 people. So, okay, our special ad hoc committees used and our uh, hearing. Yeah, I don't know if it's done or what. Who, who, somebody uh, needs to mute their microphone. Okay. Our special ad hoc committees used are hearings held. So if they have a special committee, is that committee open to the public? Are they going to hold hearings on it? Do members have a chance to participate on this? Well, we had a reform committee that they held two meetings. They were not open to the public. They held no hearings on there. So members had very little input into those meetings. Okay. And then we'll go, are the key players involved in the process? So if, if they're going to make some changes to something, say county committees, then they're then the key, then they should be involving the key players or members who would have a particular interest in that. They should be involved in the process. And if they're not, then you have to ask why. So that's one of the things of avoiding scrutiny. And then finally, is there answer shopping? is somebody, if a question comes up, do they say, well, let me ask so-and-so. Do they try to find somebody who will answer it in a way that they want, not what it is true? If there's a parliamentary question, do they have a go to a parliamentarian or do they go to somebody else? And my always thinking is the little answer shop, because that means they're trying to find an answer that they like, not necessarily what the truth is. It's somewhat like the little girl whose mama won't let her do something or daddy won't let her do something. So she lines up her dolls on the bed and asks them well, if they approve. Of course, they'll go along with it. And when I was younger, I always asked my dog and he would agree with what I said. So who needs any more permission than that? So anyway, that is answer shopping is something to want to be careful of. Suspicious activity. And this one, you kind of have to develop a sixth sense for this one. But if there are any unusual changes or practices, uh, people acting outside of their duties, is the platform committee chair writing the convention rules? And sometimes that it isn't automatically a sign of something bad, but it's something, you know, if you see somebody acting, somebody going beyond what their duties would normally do, uh, it's something to be looked at, but some, it's not doesn't mean it's automatically bad. Activity just doesn't fit into the normal order of things. You see something, it just doesn't quite, you're doing something a little strange and unusual that just doesn't seem to fit in. And these are these things, like I said, you have to kind of develop a sixth sense for them. And then the reasoning that they're used is kind of shaky. There's not a true cause and effect here. Or as my mother said, when I'd ask her something, she got about the fourth time, she'd have to answer one of my why questions. She said, because marshmallow has no bones. Well, if they're using that kind of reasoning, then there's something a foul. And finally, are the actions they're doing now, are they consistent with past actions? 
And that's something, if they've done something before and it's worked and all of a sudden they're doing something different, it gets into that if it ain't fixing something that ain't broke. And like I said, you have to look for a pattern of these things. And if you just kind of have a general uh, hunch that something is not right, you want to look at it. Okay. And finally, statements don't fit actions. This is one where they say the reason we're doing this and then you see they're not doing that. Uh, they're claiming a problem that doesn't exist. They're, uh, uh, they're not coordinating with key actors, even though they claim that that's who they're trying to help. Uh, their facts and premises are not true. Well, the reason we have to do this is because of the COVID-19 variant, and there's nothing in the COVID that, that would require such an activity. And then uh, actions that are inconsistent with their reasoning. They said, oh, well, well, the reason we had to do this, and then you find out what they're doing isn't inconsistent with their reasoning. And then the statements are inconsistent with the bylaws. They're telling you something and you go to check it out in the bylaws and you find out that's not true. So again, these are things that you kind of have to watch for and be suspect of and be on the lookout. Does anybody have any questions on these things here that we've just talked about? Is there anything in the chat there, Jason? Do you see anything in the chat? No, sir. I, I, I do not see anything in the form of a question. Okay. And does anybody want to talk in? Has anybody seen any of this stuff going on or has something that they're believe that they've seen has anybody seen any suspect activity in your organization <laughs> please raise your hand okay all right can i make a comment jill hurst has a question okay go ahead oh <laughs> joe i uh um, this is raymond i see jill's question in the chat if i can go ahead and read it yes go ahead You'll ask what guidelines are used when reporting out from an executive committee. It seems no matter the organization, report out are usually sparse and uninformative. Yeah, they should be reporting on what they've done and they should report why they did it. And a lot of times they may not think what they're doing merits reporting. So that's why one of the things that might be a rule that the minutes of the meeting be made available to the general membership. And uh, it depends on what, the, but we had a case where the executive committee was approving some fairly significant rules. And a lot of those rules violated the bylaws. But they said, we have, well, they shouldn't have been involved in approving them. Now we also have a, a um, requirement that anything they do must be ratified at the next meeting. Uh, so any and what they do is they don't call a next meeting before what they're supposed to do goes into effect. And so that was uh, ways that they sometimes. But yeah, the executive committee should report out just about everything they do. And their meeting should be open, except sometime like in disciplinary matters or something like that. So I hope that answers your question. So is there any more? questions or anybody want to make a comment or seen any of these things okay let's go to the last part and that is fighting back things you can do to end corruption or fighting corruption know the rules show the rules okay two use a point of inquiry or a point of order okay beware of the bluffer serenade or bs okay Ask, are the change justified? And finally, avoid trivial fights. Is this the hill you want to die on? So we'll go through these one by one, and I think we've only got a few minutes left. So one, know and show the rules. Do your homework. Know the rules on this issue. Own a copy of Robert's Rules of Order. Get a copy of your bylaws. Get the, you can get a copy of the DNC rules and know those. So that when you have there, you can cite specific rules and you can show them. Okay, have the exact reference ready. Bylaw, section 22, colon 25 of Roberts. 
bylaw 7.3 in our bylaw, DNC rules. So have that ready and ready to read to them. Here's another thing. If you're bringing something up, build the opposite case. I debated in college, and we had to be able to debate both sides. And I found that very useful that you're, you know, uh, if you could say, okay, why is what they're doing okay? Why is what they're doing there? Well, first, you may find out there is a rule that does allow what they're doing. But also, it, you, it, it prepares you for what they're going to come back to you. With. It prepares you for their arguments. So when they come back, you say, no, it doesn't. Here's where it is. So that's a good thing if you're going to do that. Build the opposite case, have answers. Enlist allies in your cause. You know, by yourself, it can get kind of lonely up there. And I've been kind of lonely. But if you have five or six or seven or eight people, or in some cases, a large amount of people, then you can build allies. And I think an example with that was be Sonia with her county organization, where they were going to send a letter. And she probably went in there thinking, oh, I my chance. But she had a, a number of allies and good, strong allies with her. And she was able to get do what needed to be done because she had some allies. Okay, don't attack the people, attack the corruption. So if they're doing something wrong, don't say Joe is a crook, Joe is corrupt, even though Joe may be corrupt, because all of a sudden you're going to get a lot of people that like Joe and don't want to see Joe attack. But if you say, this is the things that are going on, this is incorrect, this is not in accordance with the rule, if you attack the corruption and not the person doing it, your chances of succeeding are better because it doesn't get personalized that way. Okay, and it's remember, it's our rights that be violated, meaning it's the group's rights. It's the assembly's rights. So it's the membership's rights that being attacked. It's, even though they might be at me it's or Jason, it's all of our rights. Because remember, the rights that we have as members are not gifts. They are, those rights that we are given are given to be used as tools so we can help to benefit the organization. We can help the, gov the organization accomplish its purposes, and it prevents us from doing so many stupid things. So those rights, so when they violate your rights, it's going to ultimately work to the detriment of the organization. So that's why you want to stand up for the rights, because it's the rights of the whole organization that are being violated. Okay. Use the point of inquiry. This is a parliamentary process, and it's where you ask the chair for an opinion on something. And see, that doesn't mean they have to rule on it, they just have to give an opinion. And allows them to save face a little bit. They don't have to, you know, be, uh, because it cannot be appealed. So they just have to give an opinion. But here's the trick on using this. You want to use language that will force their opinion in a way that benefits you. So you state, you know, Madam Chair, here's what the rule states on that. Do you believe this rule should be followed? All right. Now, what are they going to say if they say they're not going to say no? And they're not going to. So they almost have to say yes. So you, you basically you've, you've kind of put them on the spot and forced them to answer a question in your way. So this is where the point of inquiry is kind of a soft way of raising a point of rules. And again, getting back to the whole thing. When you do that, be ready to cite the rule. Okay, be ready to show them that it's not something. Because chances are, you may be the only person in that room with a copy of the rules. So you need to be able to cite that rule. Use the point of inquiry. Bluffer serenade, BS. And I was going to use that another term, but we'll use bluffer serenade for right now. Okay, here's one of these things that they use. Uh, I was on the committee when we wrote the rule, okay? But that's not the same as what the rule says. But you'll hear that, okay? The rule and clearly intends to. Well, it doesn't clearly intend to. That's why I'm bringing it up. We always have done it this way. And you've always been wrong. And finally, you're the only one who objects. Well, that's enough. So those are those things that are used, the bluffer serenade in your feet. And the bottom line is, if they can't show you a rule, it does none of this stuff matters. This that's fine, but here's what the rule says. Do you have a rule that says something else? Okay. Ask about change. 
if they're going to be doing something, does the situation really require a major change? That's a question to ask. Uh, is the recommended change a logical outcome of the circumstances? So here's the problem that face is what they're doing logically flow from that. Are members' rights being violated unnecessarily? Now, sure, in a convention, the men members will have to have some limitation on their rights because if you got 300 people, not everybody can speak for 20 minutes, okay? But that's voted on by the organization. But if you see members' rights being violated on that unnecessarily, that's probably a good thing. And all their alternative methods, in other words, can their problem be solved in a way that doesn't impinge upon the rights of the members? Avoid trivial fights. And here's a very important one too. Minor parliamentary issues are not the battle to wage. If somebody forgets to second the motion, they forget to do it. Or if it's some little thing that they do, but. So look at that and don't waste time on minor. There's not a meeting I go to where I couldn't raise half a dozen points of order. But if it's not a significant issue, I'm not going to do it. Does it so here are the questions you're going to ask yourself before you go to war on this. Does it usurp a member's rights, what they're doing? Does it violate the group's bylaws? Will it unnecessarily shift power upward? And finally, are the rules are being used or abused? These are the battles that you have to decide before you go to war on these things. And finally, you have to ask the ultimate question is, is it worth it? My time and my effort for energy is what they're doing significant. And hopefully it will be. And it's not, you're not just out there building monuments to trivia. Okay, and so now here are some things to remember as you go forward with your wars. One, it's never the lie, but why the lie? Why is somebody giving you false information? What is their, what is their reasoning for not telling the truth in this case? And that's one thing I learned in journalism when I was taking journalism, and it's going to be true. It's something, it's never the lie, but why the lie? It's the leadership's responsibility to not draw suspicion upon itself. The leadership of any organization should conduct themselves as Caesar's wife, and that is above suspicion. It's, if, there's, if people are distrustful of the leadership because of their actions, it's the leadership's fault because they have a responsibility to conduct themselves in a manner that doesn't do it. Sunshine is the best prevention against corruption. If they're being, if you go to these meetings, if they know that what they're doing is becoming public, they're not acting in behind closed doors a lot, then that prevents a lot of corruption. All right. And then finally, corruption with an excuse is still corruption. When they're doing something wrong and they have some kind of poor reasoning, it's still corruption, no matter what their excuse was. So that should be pretty much the things I hope you learn from here. Okay, and what would be complete without um, the wisdom of Lily Tomlin? No matter how cynical you get, it's never enough to keep up. Okay, there are questions, there are questions, there are questions. Any more questions? Fortunately, we are out of time. Okay, I've um, just about got it done. I got one more thing. Just because you're paranoid does not mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> And I thank you all for your attention today.